Welcome to Season 5, Episode 194 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian starting my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast does something for you. This past week was great. I enjoyed a lot of the email I was opening up this week, and I'll tell you, this was no exception. Carrie in New Jersey emailed the podcast, and I asked her if I could share some of this with you. Carrie writes, thank you so much for the School Librarians United podcast. I started as a high school librarian in my hometown high school in February 2022 after 10 plus years in public libraries, and your podcast has helped me learn so much. Perhaps an episode exists, but a suggestion I have is about family outreach at the high school level. My school has a back-to-school night coming up, and I am brainstorming how to interact with parents at an event, even if they don't stop into the library. Thanks again for all you do. I have lots of back episodes downloaded to listen to. And friends, this is Amy. I was really... I'll tell you what, listening to Carrie's message reminded me that I myself this past week had back to school night. And as a relatively new high school librarian, I was also puzzled. How do I get parents into the learning commons, especially because all of their time is taken up going back and forth to all of their their students classes and following that schedule but on a much more accelerated uh, pace I think our, our parents were going around to the classes and they had 10 minute classes with five minute passings and and there really wasn't time to come into the learning commons so high school family outreach is going to be a fantastic episode and I'm hoping there's somebody out there who wants to record it because I know Carrie and I would especially appreciate any sort of support and and suggestions you can give us in terms of programming and a way that we can connect with our high school families because this is presents something of a challenge. I especially enjoyed Carrie's feedback also because she also included specific ways in which the resources from episode show notes, which she had listened to, made a difference in her library. Carrie suggested a topic, and that's also an incredible source of direction for this podcast. It makes a great deal of sense for me to focus on topics which have been suggested by listeners. And finally, um, another thing that Carrie did, which is really incredibly helpful, is that she also recommended a guest for an upcoming episode. And friends, as soon as she did that, I was motivated. I stopped everything. I reached out to that person. And uh, I will be sure to credit Carrie when this episode airs. So I'm, I'm always grateful for your ideas because friends, what it does is motivate me to move in a direction that I know will reach listeners and resonate. I'd also like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners Andrea in Illinois, Alicia in Iowa, Deanna and Margaret in Missouri, and Deb in Texas. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning Pebble Go Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. And now in a segment I like to call Why I Love Capstone. So friends, today I would like to focus on a series which I think all of us should include in our elementary collections, and I think you'll see why in just a minute. This series is called Super Scary, and 
As we come to the spooky season, which is basically October, at least here in uh, North America, we have the season of uh, Halloween and the build-up to Halloween. And yet these particular books I really love because they are not seasonal. They are simply scary. And if you've worked with our elementary students, you know not a day goes by that you don't get a question, where are your scary books? In fact, true story, friends, when I was teaching my littles, I did for real have a first grader come up to me and say, Mrs. Herman, where are your Pennywise stories? And um, and for those of you who don't uh, read Stephen King or watch his movies, um, yeah, I was a little taken aback that a student would be asking for books based on a Stephen King character. Anyway, that's an aside. But here we're talking about very appropriate books for our elementary for our elementary students. And you know, because we get asked, "Where are your scary books?" These are three scary books which you can put out and have absolutely no concern whatsoever. So this series of three books. And in this case, these are considered uh, nonfiction books. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an idea. We have three titles, Super Scary Monsters, Super Scary Places, and Super Scary Stories. Friends, these are directed towards lower elementary. We've got a reading level of approximately first to second grade. These books are only 24 pages long with a Lexile around 630 to 720. So very reasonable for our students. All three of these books are narrative nonfiction, and if you've heard me gush about how much I love nonfiction, this is one of my ways that I find to entice some of those more reluctant readers to pick up a book and get excited about reading it. And I want to make sure I'll read one of these descriptions. This is Super Scary Places. Imagine visiting an island covered with thousands of viper snakes. What would it be like to stroll past thousands of skeletons in the catacombs of Paris, France? Let's beginning readers discover some of the creepiest places around. Perfect for young readers who just can't get enough of all things scary. And again, because we're going into that Halloween spooky season, these would be a fun addition because unlike your Halloween books, these are going to get checked out year round. I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone interactive ebooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and ebooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for our episode, Weeding Expert, and my conversation with Rebecca Vanuck. Friends, I'm so excited. Rebecca Vanuck, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Friends, we are in for a treat today because I'll tell you, it's been a while since we've done some of these sort of true librarian skills, and we're going to revisit the issue of weeding because it doesn't matter how long you've been here, uh, we truly need to to rethink how we are uh, weeding, and this is something which all affects all of us, regardless of the type of libraries that we support, regardless of the ages we support. So, Rebecca, I'm so grateful that you are here with us today. For context, would you tell listeners where in the world you live and what do you currently do? Yes, so I am... Uh, Just outside of Chicago, Illinois, I live in a suburb called Forest Park, directly west of downtown. Um, I have lived here for, gosh, uh, 20 plus years at this point. I spent most of my public library career in various small to medium public libraries in the western suburbs of Chicago. I did do a two-year stint at Chicago Public Library. That was lots of fun. And uh, right now, though, I am the executive director of Library Reads, which is a not-for-profit that works with North American publishers to sort of um, market and amp up publicity for adult books. Uh, What we do, you can find out more about us at libraryreads.org. We put out a top 10 list every month of books, pre-pub books, that public library staff across the country are buzzing about. And we just started an initiative to do some 
Reader's Advisory training and programming for libraries and everything that we do for libraries is free, including, I'll put a plug in for this just real quick, uh, we have money to give away. So if your listeners are trying to get to a library conference, if they their library that they work for is trying to hire a consultant for a Reader's Advisory or a collection development project or, you know, staff in-service day, that sort of thing, check out our website. The details are all there. We It's sponsored money to give away. It just has to be related. uh, First of all, it's public libraries and has to be related to Reader's Advisory or Collection Development. Wow. All right. Well, that's a heck of an intro. I can't remember the last time somebody (laughs) offered such a a lovely invitation in in the first question. That's great. That's fantastic. You know, friends, I'm grateful because I'll tell you, you know, Rebecca, there are many different types of librarians and individuals who tune in each week yes. and, and many individuals who uh, do work in, in the public libraries. And we do uh, have that sort of you know, cross section of individuals who've had uh, their foot in, in both arenas, as well as uh, you know, volunteers and then students and, and individuals who are considering going into the librarian profession. So, uh, you know, I appreciate that there are all sorts of listeners who are tuning in and everybody's going to get something out of this conversation. It's going to be different. So, Rebecca, you've worked extensively in libraries and and you've written about uh, weeding. And I'm curious to know how your experience working in libraries has led to you writing about the, the, the skills that go into weeding these collections. Well, that is a great opening question because every single I'm one of those people that has stayed at each library about two to three years. I like to hop around a bit because I get bored very easily. Um, That's not to say any of my libraries were boring. They were all fantastic, but I like to move around. And so what has been interesting, though, was that whether it was very, very small suburban libraries to one of the largest urban public libraries in the U.S. and, you know, six different libraries in between, every single one of them, I ended up having a weeding project to do. And it wasn't like I was hired as the weeding librarian or that I came in ready to weed. It was just a factor that that played into each one of those jobs. And the interesting thing, I think what led me to write about it was the fact that I did not learn a single thing about weeding in library school. Um, I'm hoping that that is different for people who are going through MLS programs today or LTA programs because... You know, it was it was probably mentioned in some intro class or another, but until I got into libraries working with the materials, working with the patrons, it never came up and it never occurred to me as a regular just patron or reader like, oh, yeah, libraries are not infinite space. They can't. They're not museums. I always say that, too. Right. We're not museums. We're not archives. Those books have to go away at some point. And so because of the different experiences I had at each one of those libraries, I decided the more I talk to people who work in libraries, the more I meet people who have not had any training in this. Um, maybe they've been lucky to work somewhere with a great director who is very into weeding. I find most of the time it's it's not that way. You have to convince someone to start weeding the collection. Um, and so, yeah, so I just, I, I had very good weeding mentors in my career. Uh, shout out to Merle Jacob at Chicago Public. Um, I had a lots of different experiences from very positive and easy to very, very difficult and almost losing my job over one of them. So I was like, you know, these are all good stories that I tell people. Let's put them down somewhere. And so I was very fortunate that my first job after leaving working public libraries, um, I worked for Booklist magazine, which is part of ALA. And my boss there, Bill Ott, had put me in charge of a new collection development newsletter. And we were looking for kind of a centerpiece article to have ongoing. And I said, well, you know, could I write something about weeding? And he thought that was a great idea, which I really have to give him a lot of credit for, because let's face it, a book review magazine like Booklist is there to get you to buy more books. It's not there to get you to get rid of your books. So he really kind of took a chance on that, that that might seem weird for a a book review magazine to tell you to get rid of some of these books. But he was smart and he knew that that was the kind of learning content that librarians were looking for. And luckily for me, it just, it was wildfire. People loved it. So once a month I would come out with these columns. And then at one point he looked at me and said, 
you know, we have ALA Editions Publishing on the floor right underneath us, you know, one department down. Why don't you talk to them about putting these columns together into a book? And so there we go. I was very fortunate. It all kind of fell into place that way. Well, and and I think you you don't give yourself enough credit. I think all too often librarians are like, oh, I was just lucky. No, garbage. You weren't just lucky. <laughs> you, you know, we create these opportunities. There, there are a lot true. of people who would sort of laugh at the opportunity. They're like, oh, <laughs> I'm not interested. You know, but honestly, it's the, the difference is, is that all too often the people that I, I interview have these opportunities, which have have captured their interest and then they do what many people do don't do is they they jump on those opportunities they seize those right. opportunities and I, I think that's a very big difference you know this isn't about luck this you know we we make we create these opportunities and then we're receptive to them so no I, I absolutely think this has more to do with with the person who is there in the moment rec- recognizing this is something that not only will you benefit tremendously from but the larger community of of our profession will benefit so you know <laughs> this is sort of fun you and I crossed digital paths in the spring of 2021 i received an email from you asking for a contribution to a book you were updating and i have to thank you friends i will never write a book but thanks to rebecca you can find me on page 73 to 76 of her book the weeding handbook a shelf by shelf guide second edition. I am in print. It is the only time this is ever going to happen. And I'm kind of embarrassed. Friends, Rebecca asked me 10 questions. And I will tell you, I obsessed about my responses. I hemmed and hawed. This is why you will never see me write a book. This is why I don't write articles. This is why I do not, I don't blog because I can't do this and enjoy myself at the same time. But I'll tell you what, I reread my submission. I stand by it. In fact, I, I'm still happy with all the things that I said, but I'm very grateful because I'm in a book and this is as close as I'll ever get to being published. So I'll, I'll take it. I'm so interested. You know, you had an opportunity to select, I think you had contributing, uh, these were sort of case studies, Tales from the Front, and Mm -hmm. you inserted those into multiple chapters. Can I ask, because you have, you know, I'm I'm really curious, how did you decide that the individuals who you were going to call upon, are these just people, a part of your PLN, uh, individuals you've encountered professionally over the years? Yeah, so I've been, I've... I've sort of amassed this network, right, as as a lot of people have, um, by being able to go to ALA conferences and PLA conferences and different listservs and different, you know, Facebook groups and that sort of thing. You sort of get a feel for the people that are doing the same kind of work that you're interested in. So, yes, definitely it's, it's like a PLN for sure. And in this particular case... You know, I've been out of public libraries for 12 years at this point. So I was like, you know, I'm not sure I'll be a weeding expert, but I don't have that boots on the ground experience. You know, my my experiences in the past. And I thought people want to hear from folks who are actually doing the work right now. Most of it is definitely the same, you know, the, the same kind of rules that I needed 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I was pulling books off the shelf are some of the exact same rules people are still using today. But I wanted updated examples. Um, I wanted to know horror stories, because those are always kind of funny of, you know, current things that were happening. And I also had realized, just because my experience is limited to public libraries, you know, a lot of it does cross over into school libraries, especially that youth component is definitely kind of the same in between public and school. But there's also special libraries, there's academic libraries, there's reference heavy collections. And I know we'll talk about that probably in a minute. Um, And so I was like, you know, I want to get different perspectives so that people, someone reading this that maybe doesn't have the same kind of public experience that I do can still pull something personalized out of this. I also kind of thought to myself, well, it's always interesting to see sort of the same reactions that people have. And I 
think that that gives the reader a little bit of a comfort zone to say, oh my gosh, okay, I'm not the only one that deals with that kind of coworker. Oh my gosh, I'm not the only one that found that kind of junk on my shelves. Like it makes you feel better having that shared experience. And I'm all about the more the merrier, share the experience. And so having those interviews, thank you for your generosity in giving me your answers like that. Um, I just, I think that those make all the difference. I actually, if I can kind of slot this in real quick, I, my publisher sent me a book review earlier in the week. Uh, I should find out who it's from because I want to send an email to this person and thank them. It's a tech services journal. And this person wrote up an interview and I was sort of like, oh no, what are they going to say? Because I didn't want them to be like, oh, why do we have a second edition of a book that, you know, the actual advice didn't change much. But they spent like four paragraphs talking about the interviews. And I was like, yes, that was a good decision. (laughs) And they were like, yeah, it was really wonderful to see different perspectives. And she picked, you know, people from different types of libraries. It wasn't just all public librarians. And I was like, oh my gosh, woo, I did it correctly. <laughs> and it made me feel so good that that's what that reviewer really got out of it, was that those were enjoyable conversations that they they got to be a part of. So, Oh, you know, and, and friends, I, I, I think you you probably know this by now. This is year 16 for me, uh, and, and I'm weeding uh, as I go along. And, uh, you know, I got to tell you, I read this cover to cover. I read this Yay. entire book and I'll I'll be honest you know we're never done learning and yeah. and it's always this is one of the reasons why I love these conversations I love this opportunity to ask you these questions because I'm learning as we go and and it it really does give us the skills that we need moving forward so that we can do things with confidence because I I think one of the the hardest things when you're when you're brand new at at weeding is it is so time consuming and it and is it, if you can, you can, this can really take over a great deal of your bandwidth if you let it. And so what I loved about reading this is that I felt very affirmed in many of the, the skills that I've gained over the years. And, and I only would have gotten that if I had read your book. And so I appreciate that. You know, your first edition of the Weeding Handbook came out in 2015. Why did you feel the need to update it? Because I don't have both copies to compare. Can you give listeners an idea of... In what respects is the second edition different? Absolutely. So the first thing is definitely the insertion of those interviews that we've we've talked about. The other thing is I did go through every single chapter. Um, and if, if listeners have the book, they'll know it's laid out shelf by shelf. That's, you know, in the subtitle, actually, the shelf by shelf guide. And I thought to myself, when they first approached me to do a second edition, I was like, boy... You know, nothing has really changed in it's it hasn't even been 10 years yet. And a lot of the advice is pretty stable advice. What do I change? And then I thought, you know, I'm going to go through this shelf by shelf and I'm going to weed out advice that people came back to me and said, oh, you know, in my library, this is how I had to adapt for that. Or, oh, you haven't talked about this. So there are probably very few things taken out. It's more what I added in, I think. So for each section, I just went over my timelines again, and I adjusted some of them for the pandemic. That's a good example, actually. Um, Whereas a library might have said in 2019, if they were weeding, okay, we're going to leave this fiction on the shelf because it's gone out in the last two years. Well, then the pandemic hit and I basically, everyone's like, what do I do? What do I do? And the only real advice I can give is pretend that those years don't exist in your report. You, you can't, if something, you have to pretend that 2020 to 2022 is just not really there. Um, so that was one of the big things that changed. I also wanted to make sure that I included information on DEI, for diversity and inclusion. We have put in a separate chapter. I think it's chapter 12 is a whole short chapter on that, as well as sprinkling it throughout those different shelf by shelves, because there are definitely sections where you want to say, hey, wait a minute, I need to pull this out and look at it extra closely to make sure that the language isn't outdated and offensive, to make sure that the information is accurate and modern and contemporary. And on the flip side of that, you also want to give things a little room to grow on the shelf. 
um, something that you might have pulled because it didn't have enough circulation, but it's an important, diverse author. Well, you know, you want to pull that and put that on display then and get it out. So we, we didn't touch on any of that in the original edition because it just wasn't something in the air at the time, right? Like we weren't putting that kind of thought into things. And now that we are, wanted to make sure that I got that in there for sure. The other thing that's different is I replaced almost all of the annotated sample collection development plans because I decided we needed fresh information on that and I wanted to include more non-public libraries. Awesome. You know, and again... It, I'm just so grateful because I love learning new things. And when I was reading this, I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm better, I'm feeling better about this already because I am tackling a new library. And I just want to make sure you just, because so many times, especially school librarians are working by ourselves. So it's yes. not like I can turn to my team. I can't turn to my director. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky that I, I have an assistant who's there to help me, but he's a math teacher. And you know what? He doesn't know anything about reading books. And, and it's fun because it gets he gets to appreciate more and more about, uh, about the space that we're working in. On the other hand, I don't get that sort of, that's okay, Amy, you're doing it right. I just want somebody to just tell me I'm doing it right. You know, I, I'm so curious. When I saw the term pre-weeding, I, I'm very intrigued, uh, and I know that librarians listening will apply this in their own set of circumstances, but would you give us an idea of what you meant by pre-weeding and why this step is so vitally important to the process? Absolutely. So pre-weeding, I guess you could look at it in two different ways. The first way is looking at your project on the whole Meaning, how are you going to talk to your coworkers about this project? How are you going to talk to the public or your, you know, your stakeholders, your students, your other fellow employees, etc.? Everyone needs to be on board with what's going to happen. And if you talk to people before it happens and get not only their input but also their buy-in, it can make things go a little smoother. The other good reason to do some pre-weeding steps is you really have to take a look at your collection on the whole before you decide to make a big project out of it, right? So if you just have, you know, someone do a quick shelf read to see, okay, where should I start? Because yes, you could start at the beginning, but maybe you've got a section that really needs it more than others. Or, because this is a common question I get, is where should I start? I've not done this. I need something that's going to make it feel good, make it feel easy. I always tell people to start with your computer books. Um, start with your biographies, because those are things that you can pull just on looks. You know, you can just kind of scan the shelf and see what needs to come off. So doing some of those easier steps before actually, you know, sitting down with your cart full of books and, and really digging into it in a meaty way, just sort of looking at it with some distance, right? Like just approaching your, your shelf as a, as a reader or as a patron, what's the first thing you see? Do you see that your shelves are tight? Do you see that books appear to have spines falling off of them or they look dirty or dusty? Like what, what is that? All of that is kind of what I consider to be pre-weeding. It's those steps you take before you've got your full list ready to use your red pen on or your full cart of books ready to, to go in the chipper. Well, and I'll be perfectly blunt. Um, the first time I really sort of had a candid conversation with my administrators about the need to weed was when we were packing up collections to uh, for renovations. Yes. So uh, our buildings were going to be renovated. They were doing asbestos abatement. They were they were recarpeting the floors, and this involved putting everything in boxes and then moving all the furniture out of the space. And I had to be very honest with my administrators, who are obviously not librarians, and said, look, you know, it's vitally important we don't bother moving books that shouldn't be on the shelf in the first place. <laughs> yep. And I said, I think you and the movers can agree that boxing up books which haven't been checked out in 10 years probably isn't going to support either of us in our efforts. So with their understanding, okay, I understand, I said, 
a book that hasn't circulated in 10 years is going to be pulled from the shelf. We can talk about what we do with those books afterwards, but please understand that when I take books out of the collection, it's because nobody has taken them out of the collection in 10 years. So, and, and again, it took having to box up the collection and they saw, you're right, why are we, why are we boxing up books that aren't going to be checked out? So we can now move forward with this conversation because they understood that, you know, I, they, they trusted me because it was driven by the need to do something before the movers came and boxed up our collections. Yes. And so, and I, I say, I think I did an eight year non circ report and I just, anything that hadn't circulated in eight years, honestly, across the board, it, it had to go. Yes. And with, with few exceptions, but, but honestly, it was one of the fastest things we were able to do because we let the, the circ stats speak for us. Exactly. You know, and and def- our decisions were defended in that respect. So Yes. And something like that then makes it easier for you when you have, you know, 20 books in front of you that you have to make real decisions on. You can focus your energy on that instead of having that be cluttered with, oh, this is an obvious choice, right? So absolutely. It's a, it's a good, important step to take. You know, I I think this statement is fantastic, and it would give many librarians permission to trust our instincts. You wrote, quote, I've been in too many libraries where a good one-third of the collection could be replaced based on rips, smells, and stains alone, end quote. You know, I'm sitting here going, oh, I can identify with this so, so readily. I mean, you just, honestly, I don't want to be embarrassed by a book that's in my collection. That's going to go home. And I don't want to have to somehow explain why a book that looks like that is something that went home with a student. I want my, my students to, to bring home a collection I'm proud of. And, uh, and that really has given me permission to take a great deal off of the shelf. Yes, I think it's really true. One of the, I think it was my friend Annabelle Mortensen from the Skokie Library in her interview, she says, I always look at something and I think, would I want a nursing mother to take this book home and read it while she's holding her baby? And I was like, boom, I never even thought of that before. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, because, you know, there, there are some people Some of us are not wedded to the idea that books are sacred. I mean, books are wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It's why I became a librarian. It's why I do what I do. I do it for the books. I do it for the reading. But the book itself, the physical object, holds no shining glory to me whatsoever. And I have to remove myself sometimes and remember that other people feel differently. But that even those people... They're, they have to have a breaking point where they say, okay, this book is gross. This book is embarrassing. This book is not something that reflects my love of books, right? <laughs> and so, yes, I'm always fascinated. I use our interlibrary loan a lot at my public library because we are lucky here that the the suburb that I live in, we're part of a very large consortium. So I can get pretty much any title from any of the like 75 libraries that make up our consortium. And I'm always shocked when I see something come my way that I know my library would have pulled or I personally sort of would have pulled. I do stop myself from putting a note on it that says, Rebecca Vanuk says you need to weed that. But it's tempting sometimes. It is. I think I've got a story in the book, actually, that my my husband uh, went vegan and checked out. He needed some vegan cookbooks, so we got some through ILL, and one of them came through that had to be from the mid-'90s. The, the paper was all tan and foxed, and there were no photos of any. It was all text, and I'm like, first of all, text cookbooks are just a hot no. Um, but yeah, it was it was all I could do to not write a note on that book and send it back to its owning library saying, no, absolutely not. <laughs> but I didn't. I <laughs> 
appreciate that using explanations that will resonate with the recipient yes. makes the most sense. I think it never is a bad idea to customize your response in such a way that the person hearing it will find it most compelling. Uh, I, I, I will say this right now because uh, um, a lot of us uh, have just started our school year and, and there's this sort of freak phenomenon when the school year starts and, and, teachers move into rooms, and especially we're talking about ELA classrooms with these large book collections. And you may have been the beneficiary of a room where somebody had walked away from that classroom library and realized that there is very little of it that that's worth rescuing. Mm -hmm. So I think I had at least three teachers reach out to me on the first work day that we had in our buildings. Hey, Amy, I just switched rooms and I've got this classroom collection. I think you should put these books in the library. I don't want them anymore. Come get them. And, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waging this campaign of kindness. I'm still new to my building. And I'm, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm happy to help you. Um, why don't I see what you've got? And I said, listen, I, I don't guarantee that I will put, any or most of these in, in the collection. But if they're in your way and your, and your options are to just put them in a box and put them out in the hall for custodial, you know, I'll take them and I'll take a look, but you know, I'm not making any promises. And so on the, on my third trip to get a, a, a classroom collection to remove it because it was being taken over, I think by a math teacher. And she's like, I don't know why these books are here. The person just left them. I'm like, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And uh, she goes, well, you're going to put all those books in your collection, right? And I said, and I looked at her and, and I, I know, and she's, she's a young mom. She's got three kids. And I said, so imagine if when you got home from work, uh, somebody you knew left a bin of their kids hand-me-downs on your doorstep and expected you to put every single one of those items on your three children. And she, the, the look on her face, she's like, Oh God, no, no. When I, and you you could just see her realizing, oh, in the same way that I would not necessarily put all of these hand-me-down clothes on my children, I'm going to pick and choose. I'm going to, and that made so much sense to her. She's like, oh, I get it. Okay. So, so that's how we look at these books. We're going to take what we need and what we don't, we're going to find a new home for, but we in no way are obligated to put our donations on the shelf. And I, I just want you to understand that. But, and she looked at me and she smiled. She's like, I totally get it. I was like, okay. All right. I'm glad we're literally on the same page about this. Yes. Rebecca, I loved reading the interviews, uh, including my own, um, <laughs> that you included in each chapter. These librarians represent a broad array of experiences and job responsibilities in their respective libraries. But for continuity, you ask them the same 10 questions. And I'm feeling much better knowing that the majority of us, in response to your question, how did you learn to weed? Concluded, we learned by practice, on the job, and in our libraries. It's very validating. As I said earlier, that's how I learned, right? I really don't remember anyone during my degree process at all mentioning weeding. We talked a lot about collection development and not so much about collection management. And those are two very different things, right? <laughs> and I definitely feel that... I don't even know how you would approach this as part of like library school, right? Like, would you have a whole course on it? Would you do like a week as part of your collection development training? Not really sure. And the, it, it kind of shows you though, when you go to so many libraries that have never been weeded, that's because no one ever told anyone how. <laughs> and it's not something that you, I mean, I think that like, it's a, it's a natural human response to hang on to things. Um, and I think that in libraries where we are often told you're doing this for the love of books, this is taxpayer money, you can't be wasteful, the, the natural inclination is to hold on to everything and to, and to keep it all. And yeah, so that was, I, I really think that a lot of people were sort of thrown into this, you know, like learn how to swim by being thrown into the river. And, and because we don't have finite spaces, we have to weed to make room. And we, because we move buildings or we move classrooms, you have to weed. As you found, you're not going to pack up something that's going to move along and then not ever get touched. 
it's it's an interesting it, it's an interesting process. You know, and I I feel bad because I read this somewhere. I was reading all the time, and I didn't take note of who said it. But they said that librarians should change libraries every seven years. I think they said seven years. They might it's have like said a every ten years. Their skin, right? It's yeah, the- I I truly believe that if if you stay somewhere so long, the and and I and and I forgive me because I have some great friends who are amazing librarians, and the reason why there are so many of their, their they have award winning programs is because they've been able to lay down some roots and and grow those programs, and and they've stayed in one place. And I, by circumstance, have moved from place to place. But it is interesting to to move into a space for whom this this library has has been tended by one person for a very long period of time and the the transformation that can happen when a a set of fresh eyes comes and looks at a collection which has been tended by one person for you know say 15 plus years it's really interesting I, you know to have that sort of fresh perspective I, like you, I have moved from library to library, and it always gives you a, a way to look at things critically and realize our kids deserve better. Absolutely. I think you really have hit the nail on the head with that. That That is a very, very typical problem for people who don't know how to start or they're meeting resistance because someone has been there for a very long time, which is wonderful because ownership of a collection is really great, except when it starts to turn into like hoarding, right? And and I do, I, I it, people are always amazed when I, I used to do a lot of weeding workshops in person and I would always start off the sessions by asking people, okay, show of hands, how many of you like to weed? How many of you don't? How many of you are are doing big projects now? How many of you are very resistant? Just so I could kind of get a feel for things. And I would always tell people, I am not here to shame anyone. I'm not, I'm going to be gentle with you if you don't like to weed, but by the end of this session, I'm going to change your mind. (laughs) And it really is. It's these, there, it is a reaction. Of course, you've worked somewhere for 20 years, 25 years. You built that collection, right? It is yours. You feel that personally. It's also difficult for people to sort of feel like, well, wait, if I'm getting rid of something, does that mean I made a bad choice in having it in the first place? And I always have to tell people that, no, you've got to let that part go. You, A book served its purpose, even if it only went out two or three times, great. They found two or three readers. Now it's time to let that go and make space. Don't feel like you have to, you know, you made a mistake or you did something wrong. I find that When people send me questions, because I do still get a lot of questions from people, so it it always ends up where I get a question from someone who is new to this library or new to this collection, and like you said, with their critical eye, they can see what needs to go, and they write to me and say, but I have this coworker who's been here for 30 years, can't get rid of anything, feels personally responsible for this collection. And then I always try and tell them, okay, what is their personal responsibility to the collection on the whole? What is their responsibility to their patrons, to their students, to their readers? Stop thinking about the book as being the most important part of your collection and start thinking about the end user. And that sort of can flip the switch for you. You know, I, something that it, this reminds me of is I, I go on library Facebook from time to time on a daily basis. And and invariably, there's going to be somebody who shows a screenshot of a, a, a row of books. They are tired. They've clearly served. Uh, they, they, they don't owe us a thing. These are books that have been uh, well loved and, and at one point were read a great deal. And they simply put in the in the, the sort of caption, weed or no. And I always read the comments because I'm like in my head, this is sort of like those advice columns where you like try and predict what the advice is going to be. But it's funny because a lot of people are just like, weed, weed, get rid of it, get rid of it. And then there are going to be these people who are like, oh my God, in my library, those books fly off the shelf. And it's so interesting because, you know, to ask people who have never been in your space or worked with those patrons to ask them, should I get rid of this book? without the context of of what kind of 
patron use you have, it may be that those books just need fresh copies, updated copies, you know, and on some level, you know, to ask people who all are librarians, hey, look at, you know, look at these books. Should I keep these in my library? is an oversimplification of really what this process entails. Because this process entails not only should I keep this, should I replace it, should I update it, but wait a minute, what are the circ stats on these books? Because that's the better question, you know, rather than just looking at books and saying, hey, do I keep these books? I don't know, do they get checked out? That's the, that's really what you need to find out. I am so glad that you brought that up because that is another one of those things. I'm sure that I say it in the book. I always say it in my weeding programming. I look right at people and I say, I am not in your library. I am not here to tell you this book versus that book versus this book versus that book. I don't know what your readers are looking for. I don't know what your teachers are assigning this year. I cannot... I cannot look at any book and tell you if it should go or not. That decision does lie with you. That lies with your home base. But I can give you the tools to start thinking critically about those books. And I am a huge proponent of replacing. That is, Will, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but that is also one of those things that I use to get people on board is by framing it a little bit differently. It's not that we're getting rid, getting rid, getting rid. We're refreshing. We're renewing. A lot of times we're going to buy that same book, but it's just going to look nicer. <laughs> and I think especially when you're talking about students, when you were when you were talking earlier about, you know, we have a responsibility to what, I, I can't just take all these books from the math teacher because I have to look at them to see are, these, are the kids actually reading them. Kids are way more discerning about this stuff than adult readers are, right? Like my husband who got the old vegan cookbook was not going to say a peep. He'll check it out. He'll look at it. But a kid, you're going to give a kid, you know, a Judy Bloom book that's got the covers that I had in the 70s? Absolutely not. Like they're just going to look at that and run away from it. Whereas you, if you give them a fresh copy that not only looks contemporary and updated, but hey, maybe it even looks like they're going to be the first kid that gets to read it as opposed to 300 kids that read it over the last 30 years. It's, they're, they're definitely looking at appeal a lot differently than most adult readers are. Well, and I, I do, I, I have mentioned before, it, especially when I get money from organization, if when I get money from the PTO, if yes. I get money from the PTO, uh, I actually have done something fun in the past where I take the side by side pictures of the book that I'm pulling and the book that I'm replacing it with. And, and, in some cases, it's the same topic, especially in nonfiction. It's a nonfiction yes. book, but I'm going to to and I actually will put like the the uh, the uh, copyright date in a little post-it note in the corner of the one I'm I'm I am replacing, and then put the fresh copy next to it. And I, I just put a series of those pictures together, shared it with my PTO, and I said, "This is how we spend the money that you give to the library because your students deserve new books." Uh, and and. What I don't then say is, oh, by the way, these old books are going away. <laughs> right. It's, sort of, it's, it's implied. It's implied. It's implied. <laughs> I, but I'm not being dishonest, but I want them to see, you know, sometimes what I'm buying is to make this collection better because your yes. students clearly are enjoying these books. You know, chapter nine, areas of the collection helped clear up why our reference collection is such a challenge. We don't have circ stats to, to rely on. And for that matter, my current collection that I have right now doesn't even have a reference section. So are print reference sections a thing of the past? You know, I I don't like to give blanket answers usually, but in this case, I generally almost always say yes. I've been talking about that. I think I started at Booklist in 2012, and my title at the time was Reference Editor. And we immediately changed that because it didn't mean anything. You know, what we were talking about was more collection development on the whole. And, you know, in the 1980s, 90s, etc., Booklist, just as an example, had this, you know, very robust reference review section that just was shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And I was like, it is time to stop talking about reference like it's its own thing. It's really, it's nonfiction. And in... A large number of libraries, they are 
dismantling those reference collections and setting them free. They're letting those books go home with people the way it should be. <laughs> and right, like everything has just changed slowly because I feel like I've been talking about this since 2012 pretty much. <laughs> but that's because to, to get back to what we were saying earlier, right? Everybody's library is different. I am not going to come in and make a blanket statement that, you know, print is dead, print is done. And certainly in terms of fiction and even, you know, nonfiction reading for pleasure is absolutely not dead. But as far as reference goes, oh yeah, it's been, it's been a long way out. And it's, I wouldn't even say dead. I will just say it's been, it's changing. It's evolved. It is no longer the, $125 book that has to be kept behind the desk because if it ever gets damaged, it's too much to replace, right? Like that's just that, that kind of line of thinking is very outdated. Well, and I, I found that especially uh, at the high school level, everything's replaced with digital yes. uh, resources. And yeah. at the elementary level, we could bring it back down to just a cart of children's dictionaries. Yeah. So they learned how to just how a dictionary works. We kept a set of encyclopedias because that was my sub lesson yep. plan when I was in. <laughs> so the students could see what an encyclopedia was like. And we, we did that comparison print versus using an online database. But really after that, we were like done. Yeah. You know, I... Also in chapter nine, to be perfectly honest, it never occurred to me that I'd have to weed my digital collection oh, yeah. and my databases. Mm -hmm. But but honestly, and I'll be honest, part of this is because that responsibility of maintaining our digital uh, resources was, was done by my department yes. chair. But, you know, in some cases, our digital resources would evaporate because they were based on the kinds of resources the state would provide. And when the state budget cut, uh, the state budget cuts happened, my digital resources disappeared. That's not weeding. That's a loss. Right. <laughs> the self-weeding collections. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think what's interesting about that is, you know, even on a personal level, I have to go through my Kindle every year or so and weed out stuff so that I can remember what's even in there. You know, I, I do a lot of print gal, or I'm sorry, uh, I do a lot of e-galleys for work because that's what library do, library reads does is pre-publication stuff. So at any given moment, I have, you know, 400 titles just sitting on my Kindle. Some of them are from, you know, 10 years ago. And if I'm not going to read them, I'm not going to read them. And all they're doing while they're not taking up physical space, they are taking up my like brain space to have to flick through those to get to a book I actually want to read. <laughs> and so if you look at it that way, that you're just sort of getting rid of the digital clutter in the same way that you would be getting rid of physical clutter, that's why it's important to, to think about weeding that sort of stuff. I, I really enjoyed chapter 11, Weeding Gone Wrong. Uh, could you yes. give us some examples <laughs> of decisions and avoidable catastrophes? What are librarians doing wrong when it comes to weeding our collection? I think the biggest problem is not being upfront with people who don't understand weeding. Whether that is your colleagues who don't understand it, whether it's your administration that doesn't understand it, or it's your patrons or your students that don't understand it. If you if they don't even understand what the concept is, much less understand sort of these fundamentals behind it, they're all they're going to see is we're throwing things away. And that, of course, provokes a very strong reaction because people don't want to see things wasted. They don't want to see, you know, again, whether you're in a school or in public, it is looked at as taxpayer money that you're just throwing into the dumpster. Um, those are, these books could have gone to underserved students or to, no, they really couldn't. I really get the, ugh, the ickies from that. Um, but yes, uh, so getting people, getting, getting everyone the information that they need is the biggest mistake. If when you try to do it in secret or you try to do it sort of behind the lines and that, that always gets you in trouble. I don't think there's anyone who's been successful about that. 
Um, a lot of the examples in the, the weeding handbook come from my own experience because most of the projects I had went smoothly, but the ones that didn't really didn't. And they were obvious errors that should have been contained before they were made public and all of that. Um, and it, it never it never fails. I feel like every six months or so we see a news story where someone has discovered the dumpster in the back of the school. And oh, my gosh, why are there, you know, 20 copies of Catcher in the Rye being thrown out? That is, a, you know, all of that. And, and people's first reaction is to not stop and think, oh, maybe I'm seeing 20 copies of that book because they've bought 20 replacements. Their first reaction is, oh, they're stopping my children from reading something, or they're throwing away this valuable copy. And it's it's getting people understanding what you're doing is cannot be overemphasized. Whether you are putting out announcements about what's happening to let people know where you are in the process, whether it's informing people of how libraries work and why we do it in the first place, whether it's walking your readers up to the shelf to show them, or like you said, taking those pictures to show them what you've replaced it with, the communication is absolute key. Absolute key. Well, and the optics, yes. you know, this, this Everyone is, loves we, the we have to book the dumpster full of books, right? <laughs> yeah. We, we do have to be careful of our optics. Yes. Um, when, when we, when we weed books, it, I have found that a, you know, sometimes, uh, an overnight transformation can cause people to look quizzically, yes. uh, rather than something that's done more gradually, because then I'll be honest, uh, that put up some, put up some pretty colorful, uh, bulletin boards and nobody's going to notice the handful of books you've taken <laughs> off the shelf. Right. <laughs> oh, look at the pretty bulletin boards. Right. I got to tell you, I've always been compliment. <laughs> yes. Distraction. Oh, look at those bulletin boards. And, and truly friends, non-librarians walking through our space. If you have displays out, if you have bulletin boards, they're going to get so excited about all those pretty colorful bulletin boards. And they might not even notice the fact that you happen to be pulling books uh, you know, at an, a, a, you know, a, a significant rate because you, you are packing up your collection at the end of the year yes. for, for those renovations. Yes. I have my own opinions, but what do you feel are the greatest obstacles librarians face in conducting a thorough weeding of our collection? There are a couple of things that are obstacles. I do think what we already touched on several times is this sort of feeling like this is my personal collection, right? I worked hard to create this. I worked hard to be a steward of this money. I worked hard to find stuff I know my students were interested in at the time. And we can easily get bogged down in our pasts, right? Like we can think, oh, but you know, that that was this topic that was taught for five years in a row, so I need all those books on that. And you sort of put your blinders on. So that's a big obstacle is, is putting on your blinders and not living in the in the moment. You're, you're living in the past, really, right? Another obstacle that comes up is other people who don't understand how it works. I don't know a better way to phrase that, I guess. Um, again, like I said earlier, whether it's our coworkers, our administration, or our readers, it can be really difficult to get the message through to people who aren't working with these collections on a daily basis or who aren't working with these readers or these patrons on a daily basis. So sometimes just getting over that hump of being the expert and having people believe that you know what you're doing and what you are doing is best can be really difficult to get over. A lot of listeners right now are are nodding their heads going, oh, I, I completely understand. <laughs> you know, Rebecca, you have given workshops and staff trainings on the topic of weeding. What is it that surprises audiences the most when you teach librarians about how to weed collections effectively? I think what surprises people, this might sound a little weird, but it really is true, that we know what to do. It, in, in, intuitively, we really do. We need to be reassured that what we're doing is the right thing. I have had lots of people that I can see it on their faces, their little light bulb moment go off when I'm saying something in a presentation that they're like, 
you know, that's what I thought, but I needed someone else to tell me what I was doing was okay. <laughs> and I think that, you know, your, your most dedicated librarian, lover of books, in their heart of hearts knows that that ripped up, skanky cover needs to go. And the realization that, oh, I really can let that go is, is a wonderful thing. I think people are always, that always takes them by surprise that they're like, oh, and the biggest statistic that people always find surprising, I have no hard numbers on this. It is purely anecdotal. Someone somewhere probably has numbers on it, but the anecdotal evidence really is that when you weed, your circulation numbers go up. And it shouldn't, it is always a surprise to people and it shouldn't be because if you stop for just a minute to think about it, people can see what's in your collection. They're always like, well, but if I had a hundred books and now I only have 50, how is it possible that I didn't lose circulation? Well, because now those 50 can be free to go. People are not picking through the other 50 to find the stuff. Like you're not wading through the junk to get to the good stuff. Um, it also, you know, just even numerically, it works in your favor because you're getting those books out that weren't circulating. So of course your numbers look better. <laughs> but people are always surprised to find, oh, wow, like that's a that's a shocker that my circ circ stats go up when I take out the fluff. Well, and you just you're making it easier for your patrons to find the things that, you know, they would rather read. And, um, you know, I I liken this to, uh, you know, I live in a you and I both live in a part of the country that has distinct seasons. And so we, uh, you know, regularly for for you know, uh, for those of you who live in, you know, a wet and a dry season or a hot and a hotter season. But if you live in, in, uh, you know, the Midwest, we've got solid four seasons out of the year. And, and every time we switch out our clothes, I, we do a weeding and it's really sort of fun because when you do this, you realize you have things you had forgotten about. And, and, And I love the, the using the clothes as a way to explain this because all too often, especially when you try to sort of Marie Kondo your collection. If you're trying to go yes. through and, and declutter your collection, um, I liken it to how we typically use about 20% of what we actually own. And, and people are like, you're right. We only use, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of that, uh, you know, uh, collection that in this case, if you're talking about clothes that you wear and when all of a sudden, when you go through everything systematically for us, it's at the end of the season and you're turning over whatever you're going to be wearing for the next season, you start getting rid of stuff and you get super excited because you realize, Oh, I completely forgot I owned this. And right? now I've, I remember <laughs> and you're like, Oh, I feel so much better. I love that. So, yes. you know, it, 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 again, this is all about feeling better. And I sometimes, I, I will be perfectly honest, when I worked with a, a department of librarians, every once in a while, I'd bring some question marks with me to our next staff meeting. Like I would, I would come to my, to my meeting and I know friends, a couple of you, you live in, in work in districts that have many librarians and you get together and you, you uh, sort of have those, let's talk about the things that, that are, are posing a challenge for us in our respective library spaces, bring those difficult decisions. And say, look, I, I'm wrestling with this. I I need to hear other librarians wrestle with this because I want to see if my decision makes sense to other librarians. And doing that with with coworkers who, for those of you who are lucky to to work in in districts that have many librarians, to pull that sort of crowdsource those those decisions, especially when you're on the fence about something, you know, is always helpful and uh, and. I would make that recommendation. You know, Rebecca, this has been a fantastic opportunity. I'd love, you know, give us an idea, you know, if you could, uh, there are a lot of brand new, uh, new to the library librarians. We've got a lot of rookie librarians right now. Could you impart some, some wisdom and, and some, some sage advice on, on those of us who are doing this and, and still very new to, to the world of librarians. And we're, we're, we're just, Talk to our, some of our, our less experienced librarians and, and give us some, some advice as to how we can move forward with confidence when it comes to weeding. Well, I think absolutely, you know, not that I want to like shill my book too much, but definitely, you know, make, make your library buy it. I'm not saying even you have to go buy it. Make your library buy it. And I really think that I'm hoping that reading a book like mine 
feels like you're talking to me about weeding, right? Like that was my goal with the book. I, I, I'm very chatty. I'm very informal. That's how I wrote it as well to make people feel like they were talking to somebody about weeding. So look at information like that and then actually talk to people about weeding. Um, find out, is there, are there ways that you can make connections with other people at your job level that are doing weeding projects? Did you read about something online or in a newsletter or something and thought to yourself, hey, I need to do that too. Maybe I can connect with this person. Because a lot of it is you you sort of know what to do, but you need someone else to reassure you that what you're doing is right. Because you will find there are a lot of things out there not reassuring you that what you're right there's a lot of things making you question what you do so finding those people and those resources that are positive that are reinforcing what you're doing that is great the big thing i mentioned this over and over again in my book also there are tons of free resources out there um the crew manual is the big one i want to mention because that is available for free online it is the cornerstone, you know, that's what I modeled my book after. They were the first ones to do the shelf by shelf model, which was fantastic. And I was like, yeah, we got to keep, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm stealing what they did and I will give them credit for it everywhere I go. But absolutely, you can find that um, easily online if you just type in crew method weeding in Texas, I think, because it comes out of Texas. And it is a, the full PDF is there for you to download for free. You cannot go wrong with that. Um, ALA Editions has a number of weeding uh, books that are aimed at specific types of libraries. So I know, I mean, I have, um, there's a bibliography in the back of my book and I list resources for schools and for youth collections as well as adult. So look at those resources. And don't let yourself feel limited by like, okay, well, this is a public library. You know, they're talking about public libraries. What does that mean to me? Uh, the amount of crossover is really, it should not be surprising, um, but it, it really, a lot of it, you know, books are books, right? Doesn't matter <laughs> what who, who they're aimed at. We all know what ones are necessary and what ones are not. And, and definitely, you know, there's a lot of crossover there. Friends, I'm so excited. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Let us know how we can follow you on social media. Yes. So actually, the best way to find me on social media is through my Library Reads accounts. Um, those are the ones that I do most of my book stuff on. You can find us on Facebook under Library Reads. You can find us on Twitter at Library Reads 99. And you can find us on Instagram at Library Reads. Wonderful. Rebecca, thank you so much because I know there are a lot of listeners right now who feel I can start this year and tackle that weeding project with confidence. Have a great evening. Awesome. Thank you. You too, Amy. Thanks for having me. I'm so grateful Rebecca was able to take some time out of her busy schedule and share some weeding expertise with us today. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out to your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews help others find us. One last friendly reminder, I encourage you to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of our next episode will be Accelerated Reader and my conversation with Aubrey Simons and Lauren Cox. I hope you will tune in.